Hey everybody, Wayne here. Today we're looking at Jeff Davis, The Confederacy at War, a solitaire board war game designed by Arben Madison and published by White Dog Games. Um, this is a strategic simulation of the Civil War um, where he plays the Confederacy. Um, I'll have a little bit of a tutorial teaching here, and then later on in the video I will do a full turn playthrough later on. Um, for like deeper into the game and then I'll have my final thoughts kind of a mini review at the end um, Like I usually do so right now I have it all set up for the beginning of the game um, Let me just double check here. Yep. Um, so everything is set up. This is the regular setup um, And what I'll kind of run through everything quick before I do my actual turn playthrough where you can kind of see things um, as they play out so um, The game is a smaller map here have everything set up um, It's like most dates of siege style games what you're looking at is different paths. And obviously, in this game in particular, all the paths lead to Richmond. Um, that's where the Union's headed, and that's where you get to stop them from going. Um, so all the different paths, from whether it's you know coming from Central Virginia, it's coming from the peninsula, yeah, it's coming through Tennessee, the heartland, you know, Kentucky, it's coming from um, Louisiana. Those paths, well, these paths here are going to end up in Richmond. Um, obviously, you have a path over here coming down the Mississippi, ends at Vicksburg. Um, and then you have another path that goes up through Louisiana, which is going to end at East Texas, which closes them off and then causes changes in the game. Um, like most states of siege style games, what you're going to do is you're going to see advances by the opposing army, in which case, in this case, is going to be the Union. So the Union is going to be advancing on these paths, and you're going to have your generals, you know, whether it's General Jackson, A.P. Hill, um, Van Dorn, trying to fight them, trying to hold them back. Um, while this is going on, you're going to have a lot of different random events that can do anything from, you know, potential foreign intervention to... Um, battles in kind of just camera a little bit here um, in different campaigns. So if you can see in the uh, very bottom of your, you know what? Let me go ahead and just take the camera off here so you guys can see it. Might as well, might as well show everything off, right? Um, so you can see you're gonna have you know campaigns that are kind of outside the scope of this game, um, but they so they're abstracted out, but at the same time they're still in the game at least a little bit. New Mexico, Peninsula Campaign, Heartland Offensive, Morgan's Raid, Indian Territory, Arkansas Campaign, etc. Um, these are things that you're going to have, and you can see the boxes here, Arkansas Campaign, New Mexico, Price of Missouri, etc. Um, things are going to impact that it were important in the Civil War, but weren't the primary focus of it. Um, so you're going to be, um, each turn, you're going to be, if it's the beginning of the game, drawing one of these turn shits or flipping over one of these turn shits it's already been pre-placed the first four so the first four months of the war are predetermined um if not you have a sack or a cup you draw from and you're going to draw randomly and it could be anything from a new general new confederate general we got long street here you can add him to your csa general's pool or it could be a turn shit um you might draw turn shit in which case you're going to go ahead you can look at it, the little uh, blue arrow at the top, and then you place it on whatever month you're at. You're going to go ahead and do uh, follow the sequence of play over here, which has a few different things you do before you actually do the turn shit. Um, so like I kind of pointed out with like the generals, you basically would play some draw again. Frigates, you play some draw again, etc. Go down to your turn shit. You're going to take care of a couple things, naval actions, check for calendar events, and then you'll dive into the actual turn shit. Um, Let's go ahead and go through this here. Place your chit. Okay, great. We did that. Naval actions. Um, this game features, again, it's abstracted, but it's a really important part of the game. Um, this is the naval aspect. Your blockade runners and Union frigates trying to stop you. Um, what you're doing is you start off with just one blockade runner. And then in the English shipyards, there are three more you can purchase for $2 each. What these do is these are the way you're going to get money primarily. You can raise taxes to gain money in another part of the game, but it's not gonna be super effective. Um, it's gonna hurt you in the long run. So what you wanna do is try to get up to four blockade runners and try to earn money. What you do during your naval action is you go ahead and you select whatever blockade runners you have, and you go ahead and you place them wherever you think you're gonna be able to get through to get money. I'll tell you that, obviously you could say, well, looks like Florida is the best for $4. It is the best. However, it's the most likely to be intercepted by the Union frigates. Because what happens is, say I'm going to Florida, all right, cool. 
place him at four so I can hopefully get four dollars. Now for the Union Frigate, I go ahead and I roll. Back of the rule book has a chart here, Union Frigate chart. Roll 2d6, you can see roll 2d6, and based on how many frigates they have, it's gonna determine where they go. So let's go ahead and roll. 11. 11, 2c. So I got lucky on that one. So the Union Frigate would go to, you can see, 2c up here. And there's no blockade runners for him to mess with. So my blockade runner here is gonna make it through. He gets $4. Now later in the game, when you start having the Anaconda tiles show up and they start blockading Confederate ports, which you can see some Confederate ports here, um, that's gonna reduce the amount of money you get from your blockade runners. Right now we got four, so we have no Anaconda tiles out there. If there had been a tile in say Charleston, it would reduce it by one, so we'd only get $3. Um, you're gonna use that money, it goes into your Confederate treasury, in which case you can either hang on to it as just, you know, help, I got $4 to spend later, or you can start putting money in your special campaign budget. Special campaign budget are those campaigns I talked about down here, New Mexico, Peninsula Campaign, Heartland Offensive, Morgan Raid, etc. cetera, um, money you can put towards trying to succeed there. After the naval actions, you check for calendar events. Um, for instance, you can look at September 1861, Kentucky Raid. You're gonna go ahead and just, it references, what's the nice thing too is it references the case number, so 11.1.3, and go ahead in your book, in the rule book, you can go ahead and find 11, 12.2 here. You go ahead and find 11.1.3, and it's gonna tell you exactly what to do, whether it's the Kentucky raid, there's a Kentucky vote, the Confederate States of America election, etc. Those things you're gonna be able to find in the rule book, it's gonna tell you exactly what to do. Usually it involves rolling a die, and then most likely something bad happens to you, but it's possible something good could happen to you. Um, it, it not every month, as you can see, has an event, but there are definitely quite a few on the game as well. Um, after the calendar events, you check for any army advances, which are gonna be this square here with the nine pips on it. Those are gonna tell you whether there's gonna be a sustained or surprise unit offensive those turns. As you can see, to start the game, there's not a whole lot of them. But then as you get deeper into, say, 1862, 1863, there starts being quite a bit of them. Um, that just shows that even if the die, excuse me, even if the turn shit doesn't have a Union advance on it, you're still going to see Union arm armies advancing. And then you and then any other symbols on the on the die or on the turn shit, excuse me. So, for instance, I'm just kind of flipping some of these over here so you guys can kind of see, get an idea. Again, the first four of these green ones are predetermined. They go out um, in in order, one, two, three, four. The rest of them are gonna be in that cup you're gonna draw from. So, turn one, April 1861. The only thing on the turn shit is gonna be the globe, which the globe is foreign intervention. Foreign intervention, you can see there is a French and British um, unit here. You'd roll a 1d6 and you'd add that, um, you'd move that, excuse me, you'd move that unit that many places ahead on the calendar. If eventually, they get to the very end and actually make it, you're gonna go ahead and see a foreign intervention and there's gonna be changes and effects in the game later. Um, the turn shits, as you're running through them, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. This one you can see now has a cotton symbol. What that would mean is on this turn, you would do the foreign intervention roll and then you would resolve the, uh, the um, impact on your agriculture, which if we go down to, Bottom right of the board here, you have your different economic levels. You have your agricultural level, your manufacturing, and your infrastructure. Each of these is gonna go up and down based on what you, how much money you put into them and then when they're affected by random events. So for instance, that cotton, that's agriculture. So you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna move your agriculture level down from a five to a four. That shows, you know, out of game effects um, of impacting your, in this case, your agriculture, um, whether it's union efforts or whatever the case may be. And you're gonna constantly be fighting against that um, because what's gonna happen is later on, when you go into your player actions, the first player action, and this is where we're jumping in the player action section, is gonna be attacking union armies. Pretty simple, right? Pretty standard like you'd expect in most of these states of siege style games. It's gonna be where 
say you have a Union Army that's advanced, say the middle department here, up here, um, Harper's Ferry. So advanced to Harper's Ferry, we have General Jackson. Well, he would fight them, you know, roll 2D, or excuse me, he'd roll a 1D6 compared to the number. If you equal or exceed that number, you got a two. And assuming there's no modifiers, which there are usually mo die roll modifiers in the game, he succeeded, go ahead and push that army back. If he didn't succeed, he would later on be pushed back himself. It doesn't happen immediately, it happens a little later. At the same time, see how he has two stars here? To fight, you have to expend one of those stars. Um, that just shows, you know, using supplies, using up men, shows that you actually engage in combat. Um, you can then resupply them later on during your Confederate logistics phase. Okay, so beyond attacking Union Armies, we'll cover more of this later as I run through a turn. You guys will see it more in depth. I don't want to spend too much time on each thing. All right, now we look at ec um, efforting your economic levels. So those areas I showed down here before. Um, one second. Let me get the camera mounted here. All right, just going to take a hold of the camera, so I put it up on the mount. <laughs> um, so you can hopefully you guys can see the bottom right here, the economic levels. Um, what we're looking at is when we effort them, what does that mean? That means you spend money out of your treasury to try to get them to go up. And to do that, you spend $1 per attempt. And now you look at the track. So say we want to effort agriculture. You say, why are we going to do that? Well, I'll show you. We want to effort it. We get into the five box. You can see there's a die symbol with a number four on it. We would spend a dollar. We roll a 1d6. And we want to get a four or higher. We got a one, failure. We can try again. We have to spend another dollar, though. Say we got a four and you moved it up. Okay, great. All right, it's in the five box. There's no benefit to that exactly yet. However... Say we want to get into the bonus box, another four. So we spend another dollar, we roll again, two, failure. We could try, spend another dollar to try again. Or say we had succeeded, rolled a six. We cheated and we rolled a six, there we go. We get to go into the bonus box, you can now rotate it, and that shows you that you can earn that bonus in the next phase. The bonus is gonna give you, for agriculture, it's gonna be a defensive works tile which you get to place in any one of your regions on any path, and then it's gonna prevent a Union Army advance. You get an artillery, which allows you to change a die roll, um, plus or minus one, or a train, which the trains go to Richmond. You can see I have a train right here. Um, the train goes in Richmond, and what you can do is, if you wanna resupply a general in the middle of a turn, as opposed to waiting it to the end, like the normal sequence of play, you can discard one of your trains from Richmond, then you still pay and you get to resupply your general. So you're always gonna to wanna to get those bonuses or say you're gonna to wanna to get them if you can. Um, you're gonna go ahead and what happens is you're gonna get the bonus. When you use it, you go ahead and rotate this guy back. Um, at the end of your earning your economic levels or your economic bonuses, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you go to the raise taxes phase. And raising taxes involves basically moving one of these guys down and you gain a dollar in your treasury. And you say, why would you wanna do that? Well, the reason you wanna do that is because when you move them back, first of all, you gain, you gain money, which you can then spend to say, resupply your generals during the Confederate logistics phase. You're also going to gain, um, excuse me, you're gonna move it back and that's gonna allow you to possibly next turn, effort your economic level back into the bonus box to then rotate and gain that economic bonus. So it's a fine balancing act of how much do you push now? How much do you tax? And then hopefully you're still keeping your numbers high up here. There's some other bonuses as well, some other factors. Um, you can see here this um, cavalry guy, he's a bushwhacker. If your agricultural level falls to that point, you gain a bushwhacker um, tile or token or unit you can put on the board. Um, let's see. The infrastructure, you see that LC, that means line cut. Sometimes an event happens for a turn chit where you suffer a line cut somewhere in, a re in one of your regions on one of your paths, that's gonna cause a minus one, another minus one modifier for your die rolls for battles. You don't wanna go ahead and if you um, effort your infrastructure up, it's gonna, you're gonna be able to remove one of those line cut icons. So you go to the er turn end phase, union despoilation. So that would be if the union has advanced into any of your territories, any of your regions. Um, if they've advanced, say McClellan here is at Manassas and AP, with AP Hill and I have not been able to push him back. At this point, AP Hill would retreat to the Rappahannock and McClellan would be solidified here in Manassas. There'd be no other effects there because there's nothing else in um, Manassas. But say the middle department, say this was, we're in the Shenandoah Valley, middle department had moved in 
and I wasn't able to push them back. Jackson would retreat to Lynchburg, and then this plantation here would actually be flipped over and it would say plant, plantation depleted, and then it'd be a negative effect um, for that. So that just shows that the fact, the effect that the Union armies, if they're in your territory and you have plantations, factories, railroad companies, what they're gonna do. Um, for instance, you can look at factories, it becomes a US base. Same with railroad company, it becomes a US base. Um, Stand offensive, that would be if there is, and we'll cover more of this later, a sustained offensive um, icon on the calendar along with um, a yellow or red number. And then that would tell you there would be a sustained offensive or a surprise offensive, although that would have been earlier in the game. So earlier in the turn, excuse me. Um, you construct ships. So we talked about this where this is where you can pay $2 to buy more blockade runners, which you're going to want to try to get as many blockade runners as you can. You can have up to four. Um, US MRR, that's the United States Military Railroad. That would be if there's a certain number of freed, freemen, um, freedmen, excuse me. And then also they have advanced a certain, um, adva excuse me, the union has advanced. They can repair any lines cut that happens because the lines cut can happen to them as well. Um, which that gives, they give you, if the line cut is in union territory, it gives you a plus one in your die roll as opposed to the minus one if it's in your own territory. Um, Confederate logistics, this is a big part of the game. This is where you are reassigning generals, so you can move them around. You can also take generals out of your general's pool. So say Longstreet here, I had if I had drawn him and I had him ready, I could put him, you know, say I'd used up another general, I could go ahead and assign him to um, Central Virginia. Or during the um, Confederate logistics phase, or say also, you can pay to resupply your generals. So it'd be, depending on the general, um, a regular non-Virginia general, so AP Hill, let's say he was red, one star, we have Jackson at one star. I can pay $1 to resupply AP Hill, flips him back over to two yellow stars. General Jackson, because he is a Virginian, he's more expensive to resupply. And here's a little V in the bottom left. I would pay $2 to resupply him and flip him back over. You then look at some of the smaller parts of the game, factionalism, um, if there's an X crisis in the federal government, chit, Davis revolution, Game starts off with states' rights. The Davis Revolution occurs. Game starts off with states' rights, which is a minus one to all your combat die rolls. If the Davis Revolution occurs, that goes away, and you no longer suffer a minus one. That's nice for a while, but then later on in the game, you're likely to suffer a lost cause, which is then to cause a minus one again to your die rolls. So a lot of times you're gonna be facing negative modifiers for your die rolls. Um, I believe that's it primarily. Um, there are other aspects to the game. I don't want, again, as usual, like, I can't cover every single thing, but hopefully gave, this gave you a pretty good overview of how the game works, similar to States of Siege in general. However, there are just a lot of layers, a lot of things to run through, um, a lot of different things that impact you from turn to turn. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna skip ahead and I'm gonna play through a turn and then I'll give you my little review at the end. Hey everyone. All right, for the power of editing, we have now made it to April 1862 turn. Um, so I played out the game for um, a year and a half. So it'd be 12 turns. This would be the 13th turn of the game. Um, like I mentioned before, I think it can go up to 44 turns. So the game definitely has a lot of turns to play out. Um, in this turn, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. I've already kind of explained um, a lot of the game to you guys. But one of the best ways to learn is to just play it. So... I'll go ahead and get started. Um, like we talked about before, sequence of play. First off, you just draw a chit. All right, so I drew the CSS Hunley. Um, this is kind of a unique one where draw this. If you have $2 available in your treasury, you can go ahead and purchase it and it will. Um, Oh, sorry about the delay there. I had to double check the rules um, just because I've only drawn it um, a few times before. Um, what happens is if you draw the, the CSS Hunley, if you have $2 in your treasury, you can purchase it. Um, you can place it on any southern port um, and then uh, up on the map here. And then if you get the Anaconda tile and it's going to land there, that you know strangles the southern economy. Then you go ahead and discard both, put them back in the in the sack. So um, 
We actually only have $1 in my treasury though. You can't see the treasury, it is off map. I only have $1 there. So unfortunately, um, we can't buy it. So that means it goes back into the quote unquote sack or I just draw from a cup, but bummer, huh? All right, now what we got here. All right, so now we drew a turn shit. I like to look at it first. All right. We'll go ahead and we're going to place it on April 1862 up here off map. Um, normally it would be. I'm going to place it here so you guys can kind of see a little bit. Yep. Um, and then we'll start referencing it once we get to that point. So, all right. So we have a turn shit drawn. It gets placed on the map in that calendar box. Now we do our naval actions. Let's go ahead and take the um, camera off the mountain here. So you guys can just kind of see it. I know you've already seen it once, but you guys can see it again. Um, obviously, I'm going to go ahead and place my blockade runners in positions where I'm going to get the most money. So definitely Florida, New Orleans, the coast of what, Georgia, and then maybe coast of South, um, South Carolina. All right, let's go ahead and roll for the... Union frigate, there's only the one frigate. We roll 2d6. Got a five. Oop. What a five. Then we look at our little handy chart. And for a five, one frigate is going to go on the three spot, which is New Orleans. So he goes out there, nullifies our blockade runner there, which means we have three left. Add those up for. Five, six, seven, eight, that'd be eight dollars. And then there are no um, anaconda tiles on our southern ports that would reduce our take from the blockade runners. So we get a total of eight dollars. Our treasury is already at one, so we went all the way up to nine, which is the max, by the way. Anything over that's gonna be a waste. So I'm gonna go ahead and put um, blockade runners back in the box and the frigate back in the box. All right, so that was the naval action. Now we're looking at any calendar events. Um, let me go ahead and actually, I should uh, just show you guys where we're at. Sorry, I'm moving the camera a little bit. It's like, the way the map is set up with the player aids, there's not really a way to get it all on camera so you guys can actually see stuff. So that's where we're kind of bouncing around a little bit. Um, we're on April. This here's our guy. A little turn chip. We're on April of 1862. You can see there's no calendar events. The next thing we check for would be these advances. The little die looking thing, little square with, uh, was it nine pips on it? Um, which we do, there is one there. So we're gonna have either a sustained offensive or a surprise offensive. Which, if you look at our turn shit, you can see there's a yellow die, the two. That means there's gonna be a um, sustained offensive. If there had been no advances, no army advances on here, um, so say it had just been these different symbols, then be a surprise offensive in one random area. All right, we talked about the um, calendar here. Let's go ahead and now we work on our turn shit. So as you can see, there's the four different symbols here. Um, the globe is foreign intervention. We talked about that. Railroad, that means that our infrastructure is going to be reduced by one. Shows, you know, the off map, off game, not off map, I guess, but off, you know, off gameplay sort of um, attacks and wear and tear that happens to the South over the course of the Civil War. Line cut, or LC, means line cut, which means we're gonna roll for a random path and then region that's gonna suffer um, a break in supply and communications. And then we have our Union Army advance on path two, which with its because it's yellow, and we have the that square pip or square box with nine pips on the calendar means you're gonna be a sustained offensive on path two. So let's go ahead and work our way through it. So the first one is the foreign intervention here. So as we talked about before, um, roll one die for each of the um, each of the different French and then English, which I have up here. Let me see if I can just rotate the camera up instead. You guys can see a little bit. Okay, okay. You can kind of see it at the top of your screen here, French and British. Let's roll for the British first. Four, so he advances four boxes. Four. And let's roll again for the French. Six. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we've made it, what, halfway through, give or take. Um, halfway through the track, if we get it all the way to the end, then that's whoever makes it, if they do, um, you're gonna get uh, foreign intervention um, from that country. Usually that means they assign you a general, and then there's gonna be an effect if it's the British, in effect with the U.S. frigates preventing them from um, placing any more frigates to disrupt your economy. Basically, it's the equivalent of the British um, preventing a breaking the blockade. If it's the French, I believe it's just the general. Um, I believe there's no naval um, naval bonus to that. So, all right, that was the globe icon on the turn chit. Now, like I mentioned, the railroad there, little railroad symbol. Um, that's going to reduce our infrastructure by one, which right now you can see down here in the bottom right. We're at a five, at the five um, space. Oops, sorry, I bumped the camera. Um, we're going to go ahead and reduce that down to four. Now we look at our line cut, which we roll for. Roll 2d6. First die is what path? Path six. So that's going to be down here. That's going to be the Louisiana path. And then the second die will be what region? One which is the Red River. So, with our line cut token, minus one. We go ahead and we place that down on the Red River. All right, and what that'll mean is that if any battles fought here, um, since it's the line cut is in our territory, we're gonna suffer a minus one to any of our die rolls. So, we're gonna wanna remove that as fast as we can. Um, there's no Union Army on Ship Island on Path 6 yet, but once there is then, we're gonna be trying to fight them and it's gonna hurt us bad to have another minus one. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but we already have a minus one right now for states' rights at this point in the game. That can go away and you can you know, go to normal, no modifiers, but at the same time, you can also can come back later on as lost cause. It just depends on what stage you are in the game and what's going on in the game. So there's a lot of moving parts. All right. Now we do the two, now we do the Union Offensive. So what we're gonna do is we'll look at path two, which is the Shenandoah Valley. You can see we have the middle department right now. They're back in Maryland and Pennsylvania. I pushed them all the way back with uh, General Stonewall Jackson here. So first advance, because it's a state offensive, um, which actually, let me go ahead and put the token out just so uh, you're supposed to technically. So what you're supposed to do is when you have it as the, you know, have a yellow die and then it has the nine pips on there and sustained offensive, you go ahead and you put uh, either sustained offensive or if it had been surprise offensive, which I mentioned, in which case right now we're doing um, sustained offensive. You go ahead and you just put that on the calendar. That just reminds you saying, hey, we're going to have a uh, sustained offensive this turn, which means he's going to advance twice is what it really means. So. All right, middle department army. It's gonna go ahead and advance into where General Jackson is, which is Harper's Ferry. Go ahead and advance him in there. Now they share the same spot for the moment. Now that's it for the turn shit. Nothing else to do on there. So what you do is you go on to the player actions now. Um, player actions start with attacking any Union armies. Now we're doing really well at this point in the game. Um, I have no Union Armies, Path 6, um, Path 5, which is Mississippi. Grant is still up in Cairo up here, and he's still dealing with uh, Missouri Rebels. So Van Dorn is set up nicely. Um, over here in like the Tennessee, Kentucky path, Bragg has, is up in Louisville and has pushed Army of the Cumberland all the way back to Cincinnati. Path 2, excuse me. Well, path three over here, McClellan is back in Fort Monroe still. So A.S. Johnson is at Yorktown, has him pushed all the way back to the beginning, to the U.S. base. Um, over here on path one, we're at the Rappahannock, Rappahannock, excuse me, A.P. Hill. McClellan's at Manassas, so he's advanced one, but he's held he's held back. He's, he only has a two, so he's not very strong. Not too worried about him. And then right here, obviously we had the middle department advanced into Harper's Ferry which we're gonna have to deal with here. Um, otherwise, it's gonna, gonna kick us back here unless we can defeat them and push them back. So what we're gonna do is we're definitely gonna attack the middle department there. So what we're looking at, we have General Jackson here. 
What we do? He's two. Uh, he has two chits because he is considered you know, an exceptional general. Him and General Lee um, both have two chits. We go ahead. He has a two stars right now. We're just going to flip that bad boy over. So it's just going to be the one red star. To show that we are using him um, for a fight here. We're going to attack the middle department that shares Harper's Ferry with us. So what we can do is we're going to roll our 1d6. It's so a two. Now, right now we have the state's rights, which is minus one. So we need to roll at least a three because um, we need to equal or exceed the number on the Union Army. So we need a three. Right, we only got a one. Now, what we could do is use our um, artillery to modify die roll by one. However, a one, we'd only be able to add one, so it'd change to two, which would still have that minus one, so we'd still lose the fight. So we're not gonna do that, it'd be a waste of artillery. So what we're gonna do is say, okay, that didn't work, right? That failed, all right. What we'll do though, is you see these trains down in Richmond? That allows us to resupply our generals even outside of the Confederate logistics phase of the game. Which is nice because that's going to allow us to attack again without having to expend this chit. Because if I wanted, I could just say, okay, we're, we're going to use this last chit up, use General Jackson, and make another attack. But then it will reduce to just one chit. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to keep the second one here. So we're going to leave him there. What we're going to do is we're going to expend our train. Um, so we go ahead and we can just discard the train from Richmond. Now we still have to pay and when you uh, resupply a Virginian general has the v in the bottom left of the of the uh, chit cost two dollars so go ahead and we're gonna drop our treasury down from nine to seven dollars we're gonna resupply them so just flip them back over all right now it's resupplied and again we're only able to do that because we used a train from richmond if you didn't have a train available we won't be able to do that and you'd have to either just use them up or wait and resupply during the confederate logistics phase so we got him resupplied. Let's attack again. Same deal. Roll one d six. So we get trying to get a three. We got a six. Perfect. So middle department gets kicked out of Harper's Ferry and is sent back to Maryland and Pennsylvania. I have to remember to flip him over though. Okay. All right. And for Union or uh, excuse me, attacking Union armies. I think that's it. I don't think I want to mess around with anything else at the moment. Actually. You know what, let's use AP Hill and attack McClellan up here in Manassas. So we'll expend him, roll a 1d6. We have to get a three or higher. Remember our minus one for state's rights, a two. So it didn't work. However, I do have an artillery. So I'm going to discard the artillery and that will give me a plus one on my die roll here. So, or well, yeah, it changes it, it changes to a three. Minus one is, is still at least a two. So McClellan is pushed back to Washington, DC. And then AP Hill can go ahead and advance. The defensive works, however, was in the Rappahannock, and it just stays there. But AP Hill is now advanced up to Manassas, so not bad. I think it seems like a good idea to push back McClellan, Middle Department right now when they're that low number, um, just because you know that they're not going to... Um, it's it's going to be a lot easier to beat them um, now, as opposed to later on when it becomes a uh, higher-rated Union general. So, All right, I think we're good for... Attacking Union Armies, yep. All right, let's go to our economic aspect of the game. So our economic level, um, we can look down here in the bottom right, have our agriculture, manufacturing, infrastructure. Right now, agriculture is at five, manufacturer is at five, and infrastructure is at four. A um, couple different things here. We definitely wanna to try to advance all of them, at least try to, um, no guarantees, but let's try to. So right now our treasury is at $7. Let's go ahead and spend $1 Marking down to six. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna to try to um, effort our infrastructure here. I wanna move it into the five spot because I wanna get that, line, be able to repair that line cut. Remember that we had over here um, in the Red River. So we need a five or higher. So I spent the dollar, now we need to roll. Five or higher, two, okay. Spend another dollar, we're down to five dollars. Try again, same thing. Okay, five, awesome. All right, so now, our uh, infrastructure goes up to five, and we get to repair a line cut anywhere in our territory, which we have that one in Red River. I'm gonna go ahead and discard that bad boy. All right, perfect. Um, now, I would like to get that defensive works back. Um, 
So let's go ahead, agriculture. Let's effort that. We need a four to get up into the bonus box here, to get into a, the six uh, box. So let's spend a dollar, which drops us down to four dollars. Roll our 1d6. Three, close. Close enough. Try again. Spend another dollar. Drops us down to three dollars. A two. Uh, uh, let's spend another dollar. Try again. Really need that four. Just need to roll four or higher. All right, awesome. We did it at five. Okay, let's get him up there. All right, and I think that's all I'm going to want to do for that because I need to save my money um, to resupply my generals during the Confederate logistics phase. Yeah. Yep, I'm going to save my money for that. Okay, so I only have $2 left as it is. All right, so what we're looking at is we finish the effort economic level phase. Now we go to the effort, or excuse me, earn economic bonus phase. We have one economic level that went into the bonus area. That's agriculture. And when it first went in, you rotate it like this, which I should have done. Um, and now I'm going to use that bonus. So what I do is I just rotate it back. And now I get a defensive works. So you can see each of the section has you know defensive works, artillery, or train. You earn that when you make it into the six box. So we'll go ahead and we're going to take our defensive works. And I can put it on any path in any region I control. However, it just has to be, um, there can only be one defensive works on, on any path. So I think what I'm going to do though, knowing that, so I know that the middle department is going to launch another attack. Remember, because they're in the sustained offensive right now. I know they're going to attack here at the, uh, during the end, turn end phase. So I kind of want to prevent that. So I'm going to place a defensive works in Harper's Ferry. That way it'll prevent them from, um, from advancing. So, all right, we did that. And that's it for earning our economic bonuses. We just had the one. That's all we had. Now we can raise taxes if we want. In this case, I definitely want to. Um, sounds funny, but I really do want to because I want to raise taxes on my agriculture. What happens when you raise taxes? You drop them down one box. So now he's in the five box, and then I gain a dollar. So now I was at two, now I'm at three dollars. But... The nice thing is about it is that now next turn, when I go to effort them, I can hopefully effort them into that bonus box to earn that bonus. So it's a, a balancing act of earning the bonus, and then actually you generally want to tax, you likely want to tax, I should say, to get them out of the bonus box so that way you can go back in the next turn. Now that can hurt you if you tax and everything's out of here, and then you start suffering you know, economic losses like we did earlier when our infrastructure went down by one. You remember the railroad infrastructure went down by one thanks to the chit, uh, the chit, the turn chit. That can happen, and the next thing you know, you're too far down, you're not able to make it up to your bonus. So it's kind of a trade off. It's a little bit of a risk you take. All right, so we're good there. Um, raise taxes, we're good. Go to the turn end phase. Union despoilation. That would be if the Union armies have advanced anywhere and have, you know, say, advanced to a factory or a plantation. However, at this point, they have not. So don't have to worry about that. Uh, it would also be if they've advanced, if they're in the same region as, say, one of your armies, you'd then have to push, you know, push your army back. If you haven't fought them, they cannot share the same region through the end of the turn. They'd have to go back one. So in which case, that's not a problem here uh, because the only place they had advanced was middle middle department, and we already put that pushed them back. All right. So stand, um, union despoilation done with that. Now we do sustained offensive. So this is that second advance, like we talked about. Well, remember, I got a defensive works now. So look at the middle department here in Maryland and Pennsylvania. He would advance into Harper's Ferry. However, that defensive works kicks in and that prevents the Union Army from advancing. So you discard the defensive works and the Union Army stays where it is. So I knew that'd pay off. And it's always, sometimes if you can, you can try to plan ahead and try to stack the deck by getting defensive works, getting artillery. Of course, it's a balancing act of, you know, if I put it here, that means I might not have it somewhere else. Plus, can I afford it? Am I able to effort the economic levels to get it? Um, it's You're always balancing those fact, those factors. So, all right. Um, now we can go to, we go to construct ships phase. We don't need to construct any ships. We've already, I've already constructed all the blockade runners. I have four blockade runners. That's the max. So we're good there. Um, USMRR, United States Military Railroad. Um, doesn't affect, doesn't apply at all because there's no freedmen. There's no, um, and the union also hasn't really advanced anywhere because I've been kicking their butt. 
Um, Confederate Logistics. Now here's where we're gonna resupply our generals. If you're in Confederate Logistics, you can move your generals around. You can also resupply them. Um, and I'm not gonna reassign any of them anywhere, but I'm definitely gonna resupply. So I'm gonna spend $1 resupply AP Hill. So bring him back up to two stars. And then General Jackson, unfortunately for me, the Virginia generals, they're more expensive to resupply. So to get him back up to two, I have to spend $2, which I have exactly $2 in the treasury. So it works out perfectly. Go ahead and flip him back over. All right. Um, factionalism doesn't apply right now. That'd be if you have the X crisis in the uh, I believe it's Confederate government box, doesn't apply. Uh, Davis Revolution, again, not going to apply right now because the unit hasn't advanced far enough, so they don't meet the requirements. End of the turn. Go back to A. So that was the April 1862 turn. That sustained offensive. Go ahead and we'll just put it back in the, on the counter tray here and we'll be good to go. That is a t full turn of Jeffs Davis. So you guys have seen kind of the um, teaching tutorial aspect of it. You've seen me run through a turn. Um, you haven't seen everything yet. There's still um, campaigns down here. You can see the campaign track. Talk about that where it's very abstracted. Like you're basically just rolling dice, possibly spending money. Um, just depending on, you know, if you want to try to succeed or not. Um, there's aspects of, hey, you know, using your Confederate government, you can expend them to effort your economic levels. Um, that comes later in the game as you start not getting as much money as you, because you start off pretty strong economically. So as the game goes on and you, as you draw Union frigates, it starts strangling your economy um, combined with the Anaconda plan tiles as well. So I think of anything else to cover right now. I think that's it. So you've seen the game in action. You know how to play. Um, my thoughts on it, a little mini review here, as usual. Um, I really like it. Pros. It is, it has a lot going for it. It's probably the most complicated, complex uh, states, states of Siege style game I've played. It's not a bad thing. Um, there is a lot to juggle and there is not sort of those original states of siege where, you know, you roll a die, they advance, you flip a card, roll a die, the end. Um, no, there is a lot to this. There's a lot happening. There's things that can happen based on what month it is, based on what turn shit you're drawing, based on um, different factors that are in the game. You know, you're covering, not only are you covering the Civil War uh, from the strategic level, you know, playing against the Confederates, but you can balance um, the realities of slavery, using slaves. How does that impact you for your game for foreign intervention? The more you use slaves, where you're gonna reduce your foreign intervention, basically you're gonna eliminate any chance of foreign intervention. Um, or you're going to avoid using slaves, are you gonna say no, you know, that's not something I'm gonna focus on, in hopes that you get foreign intervention. But at the same time, clearly the Southern economy, the Confederate economy at this point, during the Civil War relied heavily on slaves. So if you're not utilizing them, it's gonna hurt you. And it's just a, it's interesting that this, this game um, brings that aspect, that reality, right? That horrible reality of what the, con the Southern Confederacy's economy was based on. Um, and I, I apologize if you can hear my dog barking in the background. So, sorry about that. Um, and it's really interesting the fact that they balance all those things together. Um, you can, it brings a, a realism to the game that you don't often get in games, right? You don't even get the realities of war. Now, I'm not saying this is true reality. I mean, we're, we're pushing little chits around on a board here and just, you know, just playing a game. But I still, I think that it's the designer, um, Madison, he should be commended for doing that, for, you know, making that part of the game and not hiding, hiding that and saying, you know, oh, it was only military. It was only, you know, supply lines and that's it. It's all the war was about and that's all that was going on. Well, no. Slavery was a real, real aspect of it. Um, I like the many choices you can make. Um, you always can decide what paths are you supplying? You know, how are you gonna use your generals? Are you going to leverage them and use them up? And you know, you're discarding your generals and gaining more from the generals pool? Or are you going to try to save them for later? You know, knowing that the Union offensives are gonna ramp up as the game goes on. Um, you're gonna start, losing ports, you're gonna start losing money. Suddenly, instead of getting seven, eight, nine dollars a turn, maxing out your treasury, you're gonna get 
four dollars five dollars uh oh now you're in trouble now you can't pay for everything and that's when you start looking at leveraging your government um, to increase your economic levels or utilizing your slaves which is then going to hurt you with foreign governments and foreign intervention so a lot going on a lot of fun um, some cons first of all the game's really long um, although I really appreciate the complexity and the depth to it it is a long game um, you're playing up to 44 turns so I'm kind of tilt the camera up a little bit hopefully you guys can kind of see a little better there um, up here you know each one of these is a, is a month you're covering you know you're starting in April of 1861 and possibly going to November of 1864 that is a lot of months that is what 44 turns up to 44 turns um, game can end before then if you lose but still that is a lot of game to play through um, as you can and I played for quite a bit already just to get here right just get through what was it 12 13 turns whatever so there's a lot of game here it can go on a little long is what I'm saying um, I think for most people you're gonna go into this game expecting it to be quicker playing anytime you get sort of that states of siege style you're thinking to yourself and, and maybe this is something people need to start changing their feelings on but I feel like people are gonna look at it and go oh probably a fairly quick playing game you can knock this out in an hour hour and a half two hours no you know you know you're gonna be play it for four or five hours um, it's it's doable in a sitting doable in a long afternoon or an evening just be aware of that it is not a quick playing game um, the nice thing is is that there's so much engagement and you never really know what's going to happen because of the chit draw that it keeps it i think a little bit more interesting um, and so even though yes it is a long game absolutely can't lie about that it is going to keep you interested throughout it okay um, another maybe more of a minor con the map is a little busy at first um, I think that when I first set it up I thought whoa you know not, not that I was overwhelmed because it's not a large map but I definitely thought okay what's all this stuff here's my recommendation use this the counter tray uh, which I talked about earlier in the video um, use that counter tray for your setup game comes with it you know you set up all the different chits on the different boxes use that utilize that that's going to help you um, and then go ahead and just start playing um, you're going to the rule book is not teach you in the way that some rule books do so some rule books you read a rule book and then you're supposed to basically memorize it and then start playing because you have to know everything that's going on in the rule book to make it through this is not that type of game this is the type of game where you set it up and you flip a turn shit or you draw a turn shit depending on where you are in the game um, and then you play through as the rules dictate you know almost following it procedurally and that's another big part of the game it is procedural um, and that's good and bad bad in that you know clearly there's a very strict sequence of play you're going to follow like most solitaire games i consider it more of a pro though i, I actually like that because for solitaire games that really kind of it sets how you're going to play and it sets um, your expectations of everything you're not just all over the place um, trying to play both sides or anything like that right as a solitaire game you're following that sequence of play and it's a fairly lengthy one but at the same time once you're used to the game you're going to kind of get through it uh, more and more quickly all right final thoughts on it so jeff davis is probably the best of the um i call this like civil war solitaire games i've played um that is the plays out the entire war and you're probably thinking well how many are there and there's there's a few of them um the lost cause from victor point games i own that i really like that one this one um, is better than that one that it's a good game this one is better um, this one's going to give you a better experience um, then there is the confederate rebellion also from white dog games um, different type of game i mean it's 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 still a solitaire one but that one's played from the union perspective um it's just a, it's just simpler a lot simpler it plays a lot quicker and then it is from the union perspective so you're not you're not playing as a confederacy uh, which some people may prefer that anyway um i can divorce myself from you know the the people i'm playing as it's the same way you play a eastern front game and you're either the germans or the soviet union it's you're just you're, you're simulating the conflict you're not taking sides 
Um, at least that's my opinion. Um, so in that aspect, this is definitely Jeff Davis, Confederacy of War is the best strategic civil war game, you know, the solitaire type game um, that I've played. And like I said, I played now, this would be my third or fourth. I thought, I thought there was another one I played too. Maybe not. Maybe it's, this is just the third one, but still at this point, this is definitely the game to get. Um, if you don't mind playing as the Confederacy and here's the deal, it's tough. So even if, you know, you, you play it and you're like, I don't want to know if I can play as a Confederacy. Here's the deal. You're going to start getting whooped. And so, you know, there's no, there's no, no really coming out of a feeling a winner. You may win barely, but at the end of the day, you're going to see the struggle that both sides went through, at least as, as much as you can in a board game. So, all right, well, hopefully you guys got a good idea how the game plays and what's going on with it. Um, I hope my cons didn't throw you off. I just want to be completely honest about how I feel about the game. Some, some things could be fixed a little bit. Um, like I talked about in the map, you know, a little cluttered, a little busy, maybe a little bit of a redesign on that, but not necessary. Um, game length, yeah, it's a little long for, you know, solitaire game that isn't overly complex. However, there's so much going on, there's so many choices every turn, and the fact that you're covering the entire war, I don't want to say it's unavoidable, but it works. You know what I mean? It works for the design and it works for the game. So, all right, that's it. Those are my final thoughts on it. Uh, Jeff Davis, Confederacy at War, published by White Dog Games, designed by R. Ben Madison. Um, definitely recommend it. I think it's a great game. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments below. Until next time.